It's always an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be home. And uh, Samson, thank you so much for not introducing me. I appreciate that deeply. Uh, you don't need introduction when you come back to your home church. because This is the place where I started my ministry. But I do want to say how grateful I am to Dr. Pertiri for the invitation extended. Anytime I come to Cincinnati, he is always gracious to invite me to speak. So Dr. Pertiri, thank you. And to Dr. Shoba. And it's always good to see all of you here, some new faces. And How many of you have seen me here before? Raise your hands. Good, yes. How many of you have not seen me here before? Raise your hands. Okay, that's two. How many of you wish to never see me again after I'm done? Okay, that's one, one honest person there. No, it's good to be back and it's good to see all of you here this afternoon. A little girl asked her mother, where did people come from? Her mother answered, God made Adam and Eve and they had children and that's how mankind was made. A couple of days later, she asked the exact same question to her father. The father answered, many years ago, there were monkeys, which the human race evolved from. The confused little girl returned to her mother and said, Mommy, how is it possible that you told me that we were created by God and Daddy said we came from monkeys? The mother answered, Well, dear, it's very simple. I told you about my side of the family and your father told you about his. <laughs> After a very long and boring sermon, the parishioners filed out of the church saying nothing to the pastor as he was standing at the end of the door and towards the end of the line was a very thoughtful person who always commented on the sermons of the pastor. Pastor, he said as he was leaving, today your sermon reminded me of the peace and the love of God. The pastor was thrilled to hear this. No one had ever said anything like this about my preaching before. My brother, can you please tell me why? Well, pastor, it's very simple. It reminded me of the peace of God because it passed all understanding and the love of God because it endured forever. I hope that I will not remind you of the peace and the love of God. No, definitely not in that context. But Sakshi, thank you so much for singing that beautiful song, The Goodness of God. We actually didn't get a chance to practice, so I didn't know how it was going to go, but you are just such a phenomenal singer. And your dad just came back yesterday from India, and we couldn't meet for practice. But thank you so much for ministering to us this afternoon. The title of my message, if you will, this afternoon is Be a Faithful Follower. Be a faithful follower. And before we get into the meat of the text, would you please bow your heads and close your eyes as we invoke God's blessings. Father, what a privilege it is to be in your awesome presence this afternoon. Hour. We've sung songs of praise and worship to you. We've lifted the name of Jesus high. And in the next few moments, Father, as we come to a very critical point in the service where we listen to your word and we meditate upon your word, I pray, Father, that you would speak to every heart that is present here. May we be receptive to the voice of thy Holy Spirit. May you release a special unction of thy Holy Spirit upon thy servant. And so may the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's good to see uh, Drs. Abraham and Joyce Philip. And uh, I was just telling, we have uh, such Bible scholars and theologians. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of a little, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? A little nervous to, to share God's word, especially when you have an astute student of God's word in Dr. Philip. Uh, but it's so good to see you all here as well. Uh, <clears throat> Mark chapter 3, verses 7 to 19. Turn with me if you have your Bibles to Mark's gospel, chapter 3, verses 7 to 19. What do you think of when you think of large crowds? Here are some statistics. A record of 170,000 watched the Kentucky Derby in 2015. Over 115,000 fans gathered to watch Michigan play Notre Dame in 2013. Three and a half million people attended the largest ever rock concert in 1994. The largest religious crowd on record was when 30 million Hindus gathered to bathe in a river in the hope of having their sins washed away, especially for those who are coming from the subcontinent, you would relate, you would know that. The definition of a crowd helps explain why some of us shy away from them. A large number of people gathered together, typically in a disorganized or unruly way. Synonyms include throngs, hordes, mass, multitude, 
pack, mob, rabble. Jesus, the Bible tells us, drew a lot of crowds. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark alone, the word crowd appears 34 different times. Look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. 7 to 9, where we see this word, it's used three times. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem and Edomia, and from beyond the Jordan, and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. After experiencing intense opposition in the synagogue, Jesus now withdraws with his disciples, something he did 11 different times in the Gospel of Mark. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 6 and verse 32 is an example. They went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. And in this, in this instance, as well as in our passage today, we see that the crowds pressed in on Jesus, thus keeping the disciples from having some quiet time with Christ. Twice we see the crowd described as great, which means much or many, a multitude, if you will. And we see that people travel distances, great distances, to be with Jesus Christ. Some lived nearby in Galilee, but others traveled for days. Judea, Jerusalem, Tyre, and Sidon, the word says. And sometimes even weeks, Edomia, and beyond the Jordan to get there. Interestingly, Edomia is where the descendants of Esau lived. And historically, we see that the, Edom, the Edomites were the arch enemies of Israel and were known to be very wicked and a very rebellious people. It's cool that people that far away, both geographically and spiritually, were drawn to Jesus Christ. So many people came to Christ that he used a boat as a pulpit so that they wouldn't crush him, the text says, which means to press together and afflict. We see from Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. Look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 10 to 12, that Jesus did two main things when ministering to the crowds. What are the two things you notice that Jesus did in his ministry? Number one, he healed many with diseases. That's what the word says. He healed many with diseases. Look at verse 10. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Sick people were smothering the Savior. We see this from the phrase pressed around, which means to throw oneself upon or to jostle. So Jesus did the first thing is he healed many with diseases. But number two, he freed many with demons. He freed many with demons. Look at verses 11 to 12 of Mark's gospel chapter 3. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the son of God. And he strictly charged them not to make him known. The diseased pressed around him. The demonized fell down before him. And this is a repeated action, which means they kept on falling down. This shows the power of Jesus Christ. When they confessed who he was, he silenced them. He did that for two reasons. First, there was a common belief that the knowledge of one's precise name conferred mastery over that person. By stating his title, the demons tried to show that they were superior. That didn't work out so well for them. The second reason Christ quietened them was because he didn't want or need testimony from them. He didn't want to be associated in any way with unclean and evil spirits. We know this from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 34, that Jesus didn't dislike crowds, but rather he had compassion on them. When he went ashore, Mark 6, 34, he pens these words. He saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them, on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And why he cared for the crowds, his heart was that individual people would come to him. We see this in Mark's gospel, chapter 8 and verse 34, Mark 8, 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and then take up his cross and follow me. 
Uh, brothers and sisters, in our world of social media, it's easy to find friends or be a fan on Facebook or get followers on Twitter and Instagram. But we see this passage is much deeper than a cursory connection on social media platforms. Here's our main idea this afternoon, or my thesis statement, if you will. Jesus doesn't want you to be a fickle fan, but to become a faithful follower. Jesus doesn't want you to be a fickle fan, but to become a faithful follower. One pastor used concentric circles <clears throat> to show how Jesus wants us to move us from the community to the crowd, to the congregation, to the committed, to the core. It's easy for us to count a crowd, but much more difficult to count converts. Are you moving from gathering to growing to giving to going with the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's really not about our seating capacity, but rather our sending capacity. Are you a fickle fan this afternoon or are you a faithful follower? I like to ponder these words on a regular basis from Kyle Eidelman in his book, Not a Fan. Listen to these words. I think it's very deep and very profound and I think he makes a very important point. He writes this in his book, Not a Fan. Kyle Eidelman says this, it may seem that there are many followers of Jesus, but if they were honestly to define the relationship they have with him, I'm not sure it would be accurate to describe them as followers. It seems to me that there's a more suitable word to describe them. They're not followers of Jesus, they're fans of Jesus. My concern is that many of our churches in America have gone from being sanctuaries to becoming stadiums. And every week, all the fans come to the stadium where they cheer for Jesus, but they have absolutely no interest in truly following him. One of the biggest threats to the church today are fans that call themselves Christians, but, but aren't actually interested in following Jesus Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything from them. One of the reasons of our churches, our churches can become fan factories, is that we have separated the message of belief from the message follow. I think that's a very true statement, isn't it, Dr. Terry? One of the reasons our churches can become fan factories is that we have separated the message of belief from the message follow. And in the rest of our passage, we're going to see the process that Christ uses to move people from being fickle fans to faithful followers. In verse 7, look at verse 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea and the crowds came and clamored for him. And in verse 13, we see that he went up on a mountain called to him those whom he desired and they came to him. Hiking up a mountain would remind people of when Moses went up to the mountain and to select his leaders in Exodus chapter 24. The mountain motive speaks of both revelation and redemption in the Bible. Luke's Gospel chapter 6 verse 12 tells us that Jesus Christ spent the whole night in prayer before he called him those he desired. This shows me the importance of pro protracted prayer before making big decisions. It's interesting to note that it usually worked was that men would attach themselves to a teacher or a rabbi like John the Baptist disciples did. But here we see that Jesus deliberately chose and called to him those whom he wanted. I love how quickly they responded. He called and they came. Immediately. Every single one of them. Oh, that we would come as quickly. So let's look very briefly at the ministry model of Jesus. Let's look at the three-part strategy that Jesus uses to turn fickle fans into faithful followers. Notice verse 14. And he appointed 12, whom he also called apostles. The word appointed means to make, which shows that his plan is to mold and make us into the messengers that he desires each one of us to be. The number 12 is used 22 different times in Revelation alone and refers to governmental perfection. More specifically, the use of 12 apostles would have clearly communicated that Jesus was bridging 
from the 12 tribes of Israel to something brand new. Matthew's gospel chapter 19 and verse 28 says, Truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Christ is all about doing a new thing, using a new form to build a new community called the Ecclesia or the church. And Jesus wants to move you from being a fickle fan to a faithful follower. And I see three characteristics of faithful followers in verses 14 to 15. Number one, if you're taking notes this afternoon, number one, be in the presence of Jesus. Very simple. Be in the presence of Jesus. The very first thing we are called to do is to spend time with Jesus so that they might be with him. Jesus desires his followers to hang out with him. In a world of do, Jesus wants us to be first be. When we're with him, we learn how he loves and how he handles people and what his kingdom priorities are. This is the essence of Jesus's training program. There are no huge manuals filled with rules and regulations. He is all about us living in a personal relationship with him. Let's ponder something that is both simple and startling. You are as close to Christ as you want to be. You're as close to Christ as you want to be. It's simple because it makes sense, but it's startling because sometimes we think that there's something keeping us from being close to Jesus Christos. Jason Crosby puts it like this. God will take you as deep with him as you want to go. God will take you as deep with him as you want to go. You and I must take a responsibility for growing in our personal relationship with Christ. You won't grow in discipleship without practicing the disciplines because spiritual growth, my brothers and sisters, is intentional. It's not automatic. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Can I encourage each one of us this new year to go deep with Christ? Go deep with Christ this year. Spend time with him in prayer and reading his word on a daily basis. I've been reading several chapters from the book of Galatians every day since 1st of January. And I'm doing this not just so that I can check off a box, but just so that I can get to know Christ better. What's your plan to be in the presence of Jesus and to practice his presence throughout the day? It's a beautiful book that I read in seminary many years ago. It's called Practicing His Presence. Maybe some of you might have read it. If you've not read it, I would encourage you to read it. It's an amazing book. Practicing His Presence. What's your plan to be in the presence of Jesus and to practice his presence throughout the day? If you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. Listen. My brothers and sisters, when you spend time in the presence of Almighty God, people will notice. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Acts 4, 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, but the word is in the New International Version says unschooled, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Right? Don't need all those academic degrees. They had been with Jesus. Practice the presence <clears throat> of Jesus. Be in the presence of Jesus. But number two, go and proclaim Jesus. It's a very simple ministry model. Second characteristics, characteristic, go and proclaim Jesus. First, we have to come and be with Jesus. But second, we're to go with the gospel to others. We must be in the presence of Jesus and then we must go and proclaim Christ. Look at the next phase, uh, phrase of verse 14. Verse 14. And he might send them out to do what? To preach. The word send them out makes up the root for the word in Greek, apostolos. The apostle. The apostle meaning a sent one. We gather, we grow. 
and we give so that we can go with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word preach means to act as a herald, to sound forth the message of the king. And there are four ways we can respond to an increasingly evil world where there has been a loss of truth, a loss of absolutes. First is isolate, four eyes. Number one is isolate. At times in church history, the world was so wicked that some believers retreated to monasteries. That's isolating oneself. The second is insulate. First, isolate. Second is insulate. It's not easy to isolate some people. Some people choose to insulate themselves from the problems and the pain of those who don't yet know Christ. And these people spend almost all their time with other Christians and believers. And when they do have conversations about lost people, their words are often judgmental. We have to stop thinking us versus them and move towards us for them. So isolate, insulate. Number three is imitate. I'm afraid that this is where majority of the believers end up. When we don't spend time with Jesus, we can end up blending in with those who don't know Jesus. This person just wants to fit in and ends up caving into the culture. This is where we get syncretism from. You become syncretistic. So you have isolate, you insulate, you imitate. And the last one is infiltrate. This is the heart of Jesus. We must break down barriers and build bridges with those who do not know Christ as yet by proclaiming the gospel to those who are lost. I am happy to hear that. Well, Samson, did you just mention that you are going to, you have encouraged the church to reach out to two persons or two families this year? Yeah, that's incredible. That is incredible. You should be commended for that because that's really the heartbeat of God. We have to infiltrate. We have to break down barriers and build bridges with those who don't yet know Christ by proclaiming the gospel to them that are lost. In our increasingly secular society, it is becoming more difficult to share our faith. According to a brand new book by David Kinneman from the Barna Group, you must know David Kinneman, CEO of Barna Group, called Good Faith, Being a Christian When Society Thinks You're Irrelevant and Extreme. He says 60% of Americans believe that if you try to convert somebody, you're an extremist. 60% of Americans believe that if you try to convert somebody, you are an extremist. Now that's a challenge, isn't it? Are you willing to be labeled as an extremist for simply sharing Jesus with others? Think about it. I read, I read a post by Micah Fries that was quite challenging. Here's part of what he wrote. Research has found only 25% of churchgoers have shared their faith once or twice over the last six months 25 percent the evangelical church can claim to be an evangelistic people a church on mission but the behavior betrays their belief the facts are in and it is very clear the church has a behavior problem that is fueled by a belief problem the church has a behavior problem that is fueled by a belief problem Here are simple suggestions to help us grow in our go value. Let me give it to you. Do something. First, do something. Begin praying and then start sharing. I like what D.L. Moody said when someone complained about the way he shared his faith. You know what D.L. Moody said? He said, I like the way I do evangelism better than the way you don't do evangelism. I like the way I do evangelism better than the way you don't do evangelism. Do something. Begin praying and start sharing. But number two, start small. As the weather warms up, eventually make a renewed effort to get to know your neighbors. Go and just go for walks in your neighborhood. Hang out in front of your house, not in your backyard. Intentionally pour out into your family members who still don't know Christ. Start small. Use resources. Number three, use resources. Use gospel resources that you can share with lost people. And number four, celebrate successes. Share with others when you're able to have a gospel conversation. Rejoice when God saves someone. Because there's great rejoicing in heaven over the repentance of one sin, over 99 righteous people. That's all the word Bible says. Be in the presence of Jesus. The second, go and proclaim Jesus. That leads to 
The third element of the Savior's strategy, use the power of Jesus. Use the power of Jesus. When proclaiming the gospel, it's critical to do so not in your own strength and abilities, as stated in verse 15, and have authority to cast out demons. The word there, authority, has the idea of having delegated authority, permission to use power. I'm reminded of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and everyone should know this, right? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. This was clearly evident in the early church as seen in Acts chapter 4 verse 33. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And the Bible says great grace was upon them all. Are we seeing this kind of power today? If not, there's a short circuit somewhere. I'm reminded that whenever we are when in the presence of Jesus and whenever we go and proclaim the gospel of Jesus, Satan and the demons go crazy. Satan and the demons go crazy. I think I know what some of you are thinking right now. You believe that you're not qualified enough to be used by Jesus. I like how one pastor puts it. Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran from God. Paul was a murderer. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossip. Martha was a warrior. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was moody. Moses stuttered. Abraham was old. Lazarus was dead. God doesn't call the qualified. He, calls, he, he qualifies the called. In verse 16 to 19, we're introduced to the guys that Christ calls to join his team. He appointed the 12, Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is the sons of Thunder, Andrew and Philip, Bartholomew and Matthew, Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot, Judas Iscariot of course who betrayed him. This list is not haphazard or without meaning. Please don't tune out like many of us do and we are sluggish through, the, through the, the list of names in the book of Numbers. Here are some observations that I think you will find encouraging. Peter is always first on the four different lists that is found in the New Testament. His name means Rock, thank you. And is thought of as the leader, even though he failed and bailed on Jesus. That's Peter for you. James and John are the next two. And along with Peter, they make up the inner circle. They are given the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. That was either a compliment because they had booming voices that were good for preaching. Or more likely it referred to their impetuousness. When they later wanted to call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans in Luke's gospel chapter 9 and verse 54. They were also prone to selfishness as seen in Mark's gospel chapter 10 verses 35 to 39 when they were positioning for some power slots in Christ's cabinet. So you have Peter, you have James and John. While we know a lot about the first three and a little bit more about the next three, we don't know much at all about half of them. They were just ordinary guys who were insignificant and imperfect. This was a motley crew made up of misfits. It's fair to say that none of them would have been voted as most likely to succeed by their yearbook committees. There are no rabbis, no professional theologians, no academicians or scholars or refined guys from Jerusalem on the list. They were all young 20-something men. It's a good reminder for some of us older guys, that means me as well, Dr. Paturi, here to make sure that we are pouring into the next generation. They were the first century millennials. Many of the names are listed in pairs, which is precursor to how Jesus Christ would later will send them out two by two on missionary journeys, as seen in Mark's gospel, chapter six and verse seven. There are pairs of brothers on the list. This reminds us of the importance of family connections and the intentionality of sibling serving, not sibling rivalry. If you have a sibling, have you ever thought about how you can serve together? 
There was a natural tension on this team. There were four smelling fishermen, a doubter, betrayer huddled up with Jesus. How do you think Matthew, the tax collector who worked for Rome and Simon, the zealot who hated Rome got along? Just think about that. This reminds me that we cannot pick our natural family or our spiritual family. Guess what? We're stuck with each other, so we might as well learn how to serve alongside one another. Amen. I've often thought what these resumes of these 12 disciples would have sounded like to a search form, Dr. Peter. I think that search form, writing about these, the resume of these 12 disciples, I think this is what they would have addressed to Christ. They said, Dear sir, most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you're undertaking. They do not have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience in managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel that it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, definitely have radical leanings. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness, has a very keen and astute business mind, has contacts in several high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. Listen, my brothers and sisters, that's, that, might, that might sound very funny, but if, you can, if Jesus can use a ragtag team like this to turn the world upside down, can he not use you and I? Think about that. And he will if we fully surrender to his leadership and lordship. Jesus doesn't want you to be a fickle fan, but to become a faithful follower. No other plan. He doesn't really have any other plan. A legend recounts what happened when Jesus returned to heaven after his time on earth. The angel Gabriel approached Jesus and he said, Master, you have suffered terribly for men down there. I did, Jesus replied. And continued Gabriel, do they know all about how you love them and what you did for them? Oh no, said Jesus, not yet. Right now, only a few people in Galilee know. Gabriel was perplexed and questioned. Then what have you done to let everyone know about your love for them? Jesus said, I've asked Peter, James, John, and a few of my friends to tell other people about me. Those who are told will in turn tell others and my story will be spread to the farthest reaches of the globe. Ultimately, all of mankind will hear about my life and what I have done. Gabriel frowned, looked rather skeptical. He knew full well what humans were made of. Yes, he said, but master, what if Peter and James and John grow weary? What if the people who come after them forget? What if way down the 21st century, people don't, just don't tell others about you? What then? Haven't you made any other plans? And Jesus answered, I haven't made any other plans for I'm counting on each one of them. 20 centuries later, he still has no other plan. He's counting on us. Fans will never accomplish this. Remember that fans will never accomplish this. Only followers will. Are you a fan? Or are you a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Men and women are his method. His plan is people like you and I. Be in the presence of Jesus. Go and proclaim Jesus. Use the power of Jesus. When Jesus considers a crowd like this, he is calling individuals to move from being fickle fans to faithful followers. Are you ready to follow? Yes, there is a cost of discipleship involved. That's what Jesus said. Deny everything, take up your cross and follow me. It's a beautiful book. 
that I read in seminary about 24 years ago called The Cost of Discipleship, written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you ever get a chance to read it's heavy in theology, it's heavy, but it's a great book. If I would highly encourage you to read that book, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship. But are we ready to, to, to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow him? Because he doesn't want you to be a fickle fan, but to be a faithful follower, right? Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise. Thank you for reminding us once again from your word this afternoon. That Lord, you want really for each one of us to move from being a fickle fan to being a faithful follower. And yes, that cost of discipleship is heavy. But it's one that you have chosen for each one of us if we are truly yours to lead. So teach each one of us, Father, to follow you, to surrender unconditionally to the leadership and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Even in this very new year, I pray for each one that is represented here this afternoon. Cause within them a heart to fully surrender to the lordship and the leadership of Christ, to completely deny themselves, take up the cross and follow you, no matter what the cost, no matter what the path may hold for each one of us. Truly, Father, be glorified and honored in each of our lives. We love you because you first loved us. We give you the glory. We ask this in your most sweet and precious name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.